Okay, welcome back. Today I'm going to be taking a look at two Super Nintendos I got off eBay. So I'll just crack the box open and see what we got. Okay, the first one out of the box, I noticed that it's dirty and yellow and the cartridge door is, is not working. So I'll have to take a look at that. Also in this box I noticed there are various unrelated items in here and I noticed there's a Nintendo game and a NES Zapper so I'll put those aside for the future. There are also four controllers and three common Super Nintendo games so I'll take a look at that too. And for the second Super Nintendo, it's more dirty but less yellowed. So let's get started with this project. So first I'm going to test both these units and see what I get. So it seems I get two black screens. This is not looking good. Also this reset switch seems to be stuck. So first I'll start off with old yellow, I'll take the screws off off camera and just peel the lid off and it's very rusty in here but there are no bugs so that's a positive. So as usual I'm just going to take all the screws off and remove everything and set everything aside. So now I'll follow it up with alcohol and scrub the back and the front of the board. I'll also remove this heat sink just so I can clean under here as well. And most importantly I'll clean the pin connector and the the socket for the pin connector. So after everything is dry I connect everything back up and test it again and it seems to be working so I'll run the burn-in test now. That interference you see is from my power brick and it's gonna appear on everything that I use this brick with so just ignore all that and this unit seems to be working so I'm gonna be taking a look at the top shell here cleaning it up and also fixing this door flap here's the spring for the door flap I've removed everything off camera just to save a little bit of time and the reason why the spring isn't working is because it's bent so I'm gonna rebend it back into position and it should work So here's the top shell and the door with the spring back on and here's how you slip the spring through this little opening here. It's a little tricky but you should get the idea. So now with the top shell almost reassembled, here's what the door is looks like and it's clean it's still yellow but at least it's a hundred times better than how it was before so now I'm gonna slip the reset and the power buttons back in and we're almost done here so here's what the unit looks like after it's clean and reassembled it's not too bad still has this crack here I couldn't do anything about that but you could barely notice it and still the shell is intact so it's, it's not the end of the world. So 
So off camera I cleaned these three games and they all fired up so that's a bonus. So on to the second unit, I remove the bottom screws off camera and I'm going to remove and set everything aside right now. When I get a unit with a black screen, this is the first section that I clean first where the cartridge connector sits on and the cartridge connector. And it usually solves the problem 9 out of 10 times. I also like to scrub the whole board with alcohol just to get the whole board nice and clean so I can see any damages to the traces or bad caps or corrosion. It's just easier to see if everything is clean. And now I'll test everything and once again it fires up. So it just goes to show that if you clean the cartridge connector you usually will get the game to fire up. But in this case we still have some interference. Not interference but we have some distortion on the left side of the screen. So that's not looking good for this unit. So I'll try it with NFL quarterback club and as you can see there's vertical lines going down the screen. Of course the LGN logo is perfect but the Iguana Entertainment logo is bad so it looks like we have a bigger problem with this unit so I suspect one of the main chips are bad or perhaps even one of the RAM chips so since CPU failure is common among these early units, I'm going to reflow this CPU just an off chance that this might help the unit. This cheap iron has deteriorated, the tip is now like a crescent shape so it's not really cooperating really well. So later on in this video I'm going to switch over to my other iron. So to reflow these surface mount chips, especially with pins that are tightly grouped like this, you want to use a lot of flux and sweep across the pins parallel. You don't want to sweep perpendicular, you don't have to drag your iron across all the pins. Just use a lot of flux and sweep in the direction of the pins. So here's a tighter shot and one of the pins seems to be brown. So I'm going to try to reflow it to clean it up a bit.
so I've learned from the past to always clean up the flux off the board because it will cause these units not to work. So I, I clean it up and then I'll test it out. So it seems the vertical lines are still here, so no change. So on to something a bit more serious. I'm going to remove this PPU1 chip because I have plenty of PPU1 and 2 chips. It's the CPU chips that I don't have much of. So when you remove these chips you don't want to pull at them, you don't want to yank at them. You, they usually fall off by themselves. They almost as if they slip right off once enough heat is applied. And then I like to level out these pins a bit so the next chip can sit flat. See in my haste I actually bent this corner pin here so I'm going to try to straighten it out without damaging anything else. And it seems to be okay. So here's the donor chip and the donor board. As you can see to the left and the right, some chips are already missing. This board has already saved three units, while well, this would be the third unit. So now trying to line this chip up with a camera in your face is quite difficult. So I do my best on camera, but off camera I always check my work and make sure it's lined up perfectly. So with the chip perfectly lined up, I like to drip solder on all four corners. Now I'm not using any flux because I don't want to adjust, I don't want to touch this chip at all. I, if I had a syringe, I would probably using the flux, I would just squirt it on there. But since I have a Q-tip, if I use the Q-tip, it'll move the uh, chip. So once I got the four corners pinned, I just basically drip a little bit of solder on each corner. Then I go in with plenty of flux and and edge up these pins. So my other iron was getting frustrating so I swapped to a better one and it's the same style instead of being a K style tip it's a KU tip it's just smaller and as you can see with plenty of flux you can get these um, bridges off just take your time use flux and take your time.
Don't forget to clean the bottom of the board. Usually Flux likes to seep through and this ca could cause a problem. So once again, no change. So I'll switch all these chips off this board if I have to. But I'm a realist and I understand that the CPU is number one thing to fail on these early units. So I'm going to start there. Now since I'm taking this chip off now, I feel the need to remind everybody. Now the last PPU I took off, I realized that there was no change. So the one I pulled off, it was probably most likely good. So I put it in a parts bin and I save it for a future project. So here's another donor board. Now I took the APU off this to salvage a one chip. So this one I have just one chip missing from this board so I have plenty of chips to work with. Now here's an important note, when you clean the flux off the board with alcohol, you always want to let the board dry completely, because if it's still wet, you're still going to get a black screen, you have to wait till it dries.
and once again we still have no change. So now I'm going to remove the PPU2. Now I have plenty of PPU2s on hand. It almost never fails, but it does happen to fail at times. So I'll remove it and try it, see what happens. Now even though in my experiences with these units the PPU2 hardly ever fails but Nintendo must have been self aware or they knew something that others didn't because this was the third revision of the PPU2. As you can see the letter after PPU2 is C so it, signifying it's the third revision. As you can see the PPU2 has been replaced, in fact all three main chips have been replaced. Let's see if we can get this thing to work now. I'm keeping this chip handy just in case this doesn't work, that means this chip is still good. So 
it seems that the unit is working now. The graphic distortion is gone and it was a PPU2 all along. Also I noticed that the reset button isn't working so I'll take this time to replace this reset button. So now I'll take a reset switch off a of donor board again. That same donor board that gave me all the chips is now going to give me the reset button. Now here's another important thing to note. If you have parts units or if you have broken units and you're not savvy in repairs, just because you can't repair it or just because you might not think it's worth anything, some people do need parts so it's best to just sell it for parts to repair or donate it or give it away to somebody that can use the parts. Even here, I can immediately flick this switch away. I'm actually going to save that switch because perhaps one day I don't have any switches and that's the one I'm going to use. I could probably re refurbish it. So now time to test. It works. So now let's close this thing up and finish up this project. So here's everything assembled and clean. I really like how this one came out. It's still a little bit yellow, but now with the new CPU, a new PPU, new everything, this is a top quality unit right here. And here's Donkey Kong Country. Now I forgot to note, Donkey Kong Country never loaded before. Now Star Fox. In other games they did load, but Donkey Kong Country was one that would just black screen, and now it works. So now on to these four controllers. Now I'm going to do all the cleaning off screen, but I am going to test them on screen and see what's up with them. So the first controller seems to work, but it's a little stiff, so I suspect it's just dirty pads. The second controller doesn't work at all. I mean, I, I can I press all the buttons, nothing. I can't get anything out of it. And now it seems like pressing the B button shorts all of them together. The third controller doesn't seem to be working either. And finally, the fourth controller is much like the first one. It does work, but it's a little stiff. So I suspect all four of these controllers just need to be cleaned. Now here are the controllers after they've been cleaned and scrubbed up. Let's see if they work now. So it seems after a good clean these controllers seem to be working just fine. So this was really a fun project. I'm really glad I got everything to work. So if you really enjoyed this video, please like, comment, subscribe, share this with your friends. And once again, thank you for watching.